Good morning, everybody. Are you glad to be here? Hey, we start a new, uh, a new what do you call them, series. We, co- we start a new series today called Louder Than Words. And this is a story, if you read the little piece at the bottom here, it says, from the book of Acts. We're taking stories from the book of Acts, and we're talking about those stories during this series, but we don't, this is not a series just to tell a bunch of stories, okay? This is not just a story series to come and hear stories. We, <clears throat> we, we teach and we learn in order to do. And so uh, today's story is um, probably the most important story in the book of Acts. It's when God began his church. It's when he filled his people with his spirit on the day of Pentecost. Anybody remember that story? This, is, this story has my wife so nervous about what I'm going to say about tongues today. Uh, she's never been so nervous about a message before, but we, look, we're going to tackle this. Jesus is not nervous about uh, today's message. Uh, at least I hope he's not me- nervous about today's message. But uh, So, louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. And today, uh, I've entitled this message, More Than Words. Now, it's because that, that on the day of Pentecost, what happened there was more than words. It was more than words. It's also an extreme song. Remember that song, More Than Words? The guys with the long black hair. How can we forget? More than words. It's, it's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I just want to go ahead and tell you what the theme is today. The theme is, and God, I, I'm telling you, over the past couple of weeks, God has really just been speaking this over and over and over to me. And I wanted to say something about it last week. I, I, I was hoping that I might have time to say something about it last week. But um, there was just too much going on last week. And, and, and so this week, I just want this to be the theme. And it fits perfectly with what we're talking about today. And this is the theme that we need to major on the major things and minor on on the minor things because <clears throat> in the church it's in our culture uh it's all over the place actually but especially in the church we major on the minor things those are the things that that divide us by the way when we major on the minor things we get divided that's why we're so fragmented as a church and why we're so divided. And this group doesn't like this group. And this group says this group is not going to heaven. And this group, I mean, it's, it's so crazy because we have majored on the minor things. And what God is saying to me over the past two weeks, I want you to major on the major things. And I want you to minor on the minor things. And so we're going to make it real clear today what the major things are and what the minor things are. And listen, everything in the Bible is not created equal. Everything, every line in the Bible does not have the same amount of importance. Everything that even Jesus said does not have the same equality of importance. That may, that sounds crazy to people who are so high on the Bible, but it's true. And Paul talks about it. There are some things that are best, you know, and then there are some things that are not uh, the best. And choose the best things and and all throughout the scripture, we see God putting, uh, putting priorities together for us. And so we're going to see that today. And we're just going to dive right in because I have a ton of scripture, a ton of slides, maybe more than I've ever had before. But we're just, we're just going to dive right in to Acts chapter 2. And this is how it starts. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound. Okay, some people say it's a wind. But it's not a wind, it's a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So they're sitting in this house and they hear something, they begin to hear something. And it sounds like a rushing wind. If you live over in Hampton Cove area where I, where, where I live, it's like when they're testing things out on the arsenal, you know, in your house begins to shake it's it was kind of like that you're hearing a noise it's not a wind but it sounds like a wind they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them now they were hearing something and they were seeing something um if you've ever looked at a fire you ever thought about a fire fire is a very good 
metaphor for this because what, uh, and I can understand why God used it, but fire, you know, it's, it's energy. You know, it's, it's uh, when you see this flame of, of fire, it's given off light and it's given off heat and, and it's energy. And, and if you look at the flame, it looks like tongues, right? It, it kind of looks like tongues. And we even use this, this word, the flames were licking, you know, that were licking up. And so uh, for, for, for a long time, people have associated fire with tongues. It kind of looks like tongues. And that's what they saw. They saw so this, this thing that looked like fire, and then, and then it divided. And, and each one of these little um, tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each one of them. So they're hearing something and they're seeing something. It's a miraculous thing that is happening. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So uh, one thing I want to point out is the Spirit enabled them. This was by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Think about that. They were, there were, and I, and I didn't list all these because it's just too long and I already had too many scriptures, so I didn't list them. But you can go and read if you want to. And it lists, this long list of people, there are different people groups that are speaking different languages. And they were all together, it says God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They spoke different languages. When they had heard this sound, a crowd came together in be bewilderment. Because each one heard their own language being spoken. Now, this is what's happening. <clears throat> these apostles, these followers of Jesus, are speaking in a different language than is their native tongue. They are speaking this different language. And everybody there who speaks different languages, we're all hearing them and understanding what they were saying. That's the miracle, okay? It's a miracle on the one on the, on, the, on the one side of the people who are doing the speaking, and it's a miracle on the other side of, of the people that are doing the hearing. You understand what's happening? And, and so that is the miracle. It's a miracle of communication. It is a miracle of understanding. That's what this was all about. And I can just imagine why God did it this way and what he is saying to us through this experience. He is saying, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you are from, I don't care what language you speak, what culture you're from, what beliefs you have, whether you're uh, black or white or yellow or brown or, or whether you're young or old, male or female, uh, it doesn't matter whoever you are, I am speaking to you. I'm speaking to you. And so this is God's nature. It's, it's who he is. In the beginning was the Word. That's the way John described Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. It's the way he described God. The Logos. The saying. In the beginning, there was saying. There were, there were things being said. And it was God. And it was with God. It was God. And that saying became flesh and dwelled among us. That was Jesus. It's awesome to imagine. But this is God's nature. He speaks. It's... You know, he created us in his image, right? And so this is one of the things that separates us from all the other species of animals on the earth. Is that we can speak. Now, Lene thinks that our dog speaks. But not in the way that we speak. We can communicate with each other. We can write down things. And we can actually read things that were written down by people who could speak and who could write and who could read thousands of years ago and we can and we can we can read that because god made us in his image and this is one of the things we're always speaking god is always speaking it, it's his nature it's our nature and this is how god started his church with this miracle of understanding let's move on utterly amazed they ask aren't all of these who are speaking galileans then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? How is that? It's a miracle. 
Some, however, and this is just, like this is always the way it happens, right? Whenever God does something, there's always somebody like this. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Isn't that the way it is? Every time God does something miraculous, whenever God does something real and meaningful, there's always somebody who says, they're crazy, they're drunk, it's not real. Peter then stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Think about this. Now, he's probably speaking in these same tongues. It's amazing. He's speaking to all of these people. He says, listen, pay careful attention to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. They might be drinkers, but they're not drunk yet, okay? It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This was prophesied by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. This is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take a drink. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And this was what was prophesied. God knew what he was doing before it ever even happened. This was not a, an afterthought by God. This was planned by God. This was a fulfillment a prophecy. And so uh, this was a miracle of understanding, a miracle of communication. Now, um, there is another type of tongues that Paul talks about, and I think this is what made Lene nervous as I was going to talk about, about this. But uh, there's another type of tongues that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. It's mentioned in Acts. And there are some people who have majored on the minor things, and they have said, you on, only people who speak with other tongues are filled by the Holy Spirit. There are whole denominations that are centered around this, this belief. And so they ne- neglect the major things, and they have camped out on this minor thing. And uh, let me just tell you that this type of tongues is a beautiful thing. It is a real thing. It is given by God it is absolutely real it is beneficial but many people have used it in the wrong way I'll just tell you that I have uh, I have been a part of churches who use tongues in the church if I spent several years going to church where it was very common for people to use tongues in the church and uh, I have practiced it myself for more than 30 years, and so I'm acquainted with it. It's not, it's not, um, it's not something that, that I'm telling you about that I don't know anything about. I'm very familiar with this other kind of tongues. And let me just tell you, it's a beautiful thing. It's like, it's, like, uh, it's, it's very intimate with God. It's very personal with Him. It's very... Uh, uh, it's very sweet. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a good thing, and uh, and when it is used in the right way, when when it's really God and when it's really used in the right way, it is a beautiful and powerful thing. However, these Corinthians, and we're going to take a look at the next few uh, passages are from Corinthians. In Corinthians, Paul, these Corinthians, they're, they're living in this, this, uh, this metropolis. You know, it's, it's the hub of um, uh, buying and selling goods and that kind of thing. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a culture of paganism. And, and so Paul started a church here, and he is trying to straighten these people out. All through Corinthians, you read, he's, he's really he's trying to, come on, guys, this... Major on the major things, and minor on the minor things. And what was happening then, and it still happens today, 
is that people were taking this gift of tongues and they were bringing it into the church and it was becoming disruptive in the church. And I have been in church services where, you know, uh, it becomes disruptive. This one person starts speaking, speaker number one begins to speak, and then speaker number two is trying to outdo speaker number one, and then speaker number three is trying to outdo two and one, and it just becomes chaotic, and it becomes this thing that should not be in the church, and that's what was happening in uh, 1 Corinthians, and it's like what Jesus said about praying and fasting and giving. He says about giving, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He says about praying, go into your prayer room and close the door he says about fasting he says when you fast don't don't let everybody know that you're fasting wash your face and comb your hair and take care of yourself let this be between you and God and that's the way I feel about this particular gift of tongues and Paul uh, through first Corinthians you can you can read if you read the whole book you, you hear how he begins talking about tongues and at first, he starts giving rules. Okay, if, the, if there is somebody that has a tongue, make sure that there is, make sure that there are not more than one or two or three that do this, okay? And then if, if you do it, then make sure there's an interpreter. And then he finally comes to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and, he's, and this, this is what he says. He says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. And that's, that's what it is. My spirit prays. But my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the... See, you're putting someone in the position. When you, when you do this in front of other people, you're putting someone in the position of an inquirer. Okay, how can someone put in the position of inquire say amen to your thanksgiving since they do not know what you are saying? It's confusing. You see, the first, the first event was a miracle of understanding and then this other uh, tongues event that was happening, it is, it is not just a different kind of tongues, it is opposite. No one understands. So in the first one, everyone understood on the day of Pentecost. With this, no one understands unless you have that gift of interpretation. So let's keep on going. You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. I thank God. Now, this is the part I want, to, I want you to get. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. See, they were speaking in tongues and thinking, that, oh, I am... Boy, I'm blessed by God. I'm, you know, I have this gift. And I want to use it. And I want people to see it. I want people to know it. And Paul, is, he's just putting a stop to all that. You think you have a gift? Listen, I speak. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000. 10,000 words in a tongue. He's saying in a setting like this, we come together for a church service, he's saying, just, just don't do it. Just, just I, speak words of understanding. All right? Now, this is a pro progression, and I, I want you to see uh, the progression as we move on. But this is, this is how, this is, this is, this is how God wants us to be as a church. He wants us to be wise and he wants us to have understanding and he wants us to be mature and he wants us to to get the major things and not be hung up hung up on the minor things i'm going to go to uh first corinthians chapter 12 now and and paul begins to lay out a uh, foundation and he begins to to teach us Something that is very beneficial for us. And I love where we're going to end up today. But there's a lot of, there are a lot of verses in there, so I'm going to get through them really quick. I just want you to s try to follow me here. He's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, toward the end, he says, Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, prophets. Listen, he's not just given us a list, he's given us a priority. He's given us a priority. He says, first of all, 
apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then, miracles. Then, gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and uh, different kinds of tongues. He says, are all apostles? No, not all are apostles. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. He's given us a priority now. And he says, if you're, gonna, if you're, gonna, if you're going to desire these gifts, desire the best gifts. Desire the greater gifts. And tongues, while it is a beautiful gift, in importance, he has put it at the bottom of the list. And then he says this, And yet I will show you the most excellent way. All of these gifts are great. All of these gifts are great. But yet, okay, yet I'm going to show you the most excellent way. This is where God wants to take us. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, see, the Corinthians, they were thinking, oh, I'm speaking in tongues. Well, I, I'm speaking the language of God. I, I'm special. Now, I'm speaking the language of God. He said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't major on that. Don't major on that. If I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, the most excellent thing, love, the best thing, the love that encompasses everything that is good. If I don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. You're just making noise. That's what he's saying. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, if you have all these supernatural gifts, you, can, you have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith Jesus was always talking about faith. If I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love, this is what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Listen, love is patient. It, the Corinthians, when they were taking the Lord's Supper, they would go in, the first ones to get there, and they would eat up all the bread and drink up all the wine. That's what they were doing, these foolish Corinthians. And Paul said, don't you have houses to eat in? That you, you don't even leave the Lord's Supper for somebody else? What's happening with you? You're not patient. You don't... You need love. You need to be patient. You need to be kind. Leave, let somebody else have the Lord's Supper too. They were all mixed up. They were majoring on the minor things. It does not envy. It does not boast. Don't boast about your gifts. If you have a gift, great. Let that be between you and God. And, on, and only bring that out when God moves on you to, and it's beneficial for others. Don't boast. It is not about you. It's not about you. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It doesn't dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no... Re Where is Lene? It keeps no record... It keeps no record of wrongs. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. I was here this week, and uh, we were putting up the, 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 the speakers, and we were doing some work here in the worship center. And uh, I was up here one day by myself, and um, I was thinking uh, about temptation. I was thinking about how quick temptation comes it can come just like in a second you know temptation can come and I was I was just asking the Lord I was coming down the stairs actually I was coming down the stairs and I was asking the Lord I was saying Lord 
whenever, whenever I am tempted, could you just help me? Could you help me to, to focus on your goodness, on your truth? Can you just give me that perspective? Really, it's about perspective, isn't it? I mean, it's about how you look at things. And I was just asking him as I was coming down those stairs, coming down from the office, I was, I was saying, Lord, can't, can't you just help me to focus on the things that are good and the things that are true in those moments? And uh, if we could do that, boy, we'd be so much better off. But love does not delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It, the truth brings so much joy to our lives. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I love that. It always protects. Love protects. Love protects the other person. The person that you, you want to say that word, and I did, listen, I did that this week. I said something about somebody else. I had to go back and apologize because love protects. It protects the person that you want to say something about, something derogatory. It protects. It always trusts. Love trusts God. Love always hopes. It always perseveres. And then... He gets down to it. He says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. You see what he's doing here? He's saying, listen, the gifts are great. Don't put those up here at the top of the list. This is not the main thing. It's great, but it's not the main thing. He says, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Those of us who think we are so smart, know God so well, knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When completeness comes, what is in part disappears. I was praying this week, and... Um, I had a list of things that I was going to pray about. Major things in my life, okay? Major things. I was going to pray. I'm not going to name any of the things I was going to pray about. But there are some major things. And so I went into the room where I pray, and I closed the door. And I sat down, and I began to pray. And this is my practice whenever I pray. And it's how Jesus gave, he gave us uh, you know, like an outline of the Lord's Prayer how to pray, um, and so I, I, began, I just began, like I always do, to praise God, and thank Him, thank you, Lord, thank you for Lene, my beautiful wife, thank you for her heart, thank you for who she is, thank you for Hampton, thank you for the man that he is becoming, thank you for Houston, and his sweet heart, and thank you for Mason, and how thoughtful he is, you know, and I was just, it was a lot longer than that, but I was just thanking him for all these people in my life, and I, and, I was th- and I was praying for them individually. And you know what I was doing? I was practicing this love thing. The, the most important thing. The most important thing. That was what I was practicing in my prayer. That's what I was praying for. And the, the funny thing happened. A funny thing happened. And it, it really surprised me. When I got finished praying about all the the loved ones in my life, all my family, and I pray, when when I sit down to pray and I start this way, I pray for everybody. I pray for my parents and my brother and Lene's mom and her brother and his family. I pray for everybody. When I got finished with that, I took my list and I watered it up, threw it in the garbage can. It's just the way I felt at the time. Lord, this... And you know what I said? I said, Lord, you know everything on this list. I, I'm not going to bother with it. You know everything on the list. I trust you, Lord. Love trust. You know, love trusts. And I just trusted him with my list. I threw it away. It didn't seem important anymore whenever I was practicing love. When I was a child, I talked like a child. He's, he's going to give us the past He's going to give us the present. He's going to give us the future. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away. I put the ways of childhood behind me. 
For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Get this now. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. If you were to if God gave me any of these other gifts, and He has given me some of these, these spiritual gifts, um, and if, if I had this list, faith, hope, love, and then any of these others, and I could only keep three, guess which three I would keep? Faith, hope, and love. I would never give up my faith. My faith has brought me through times when I, I can't even tell you this faith that we have is so strong. It is so reliable. It is so solid. I would never give up my faith. I would never give up my hope. Hope is what gets me up in the morning. I would never give up my hope. I would never give up my love. These three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of even these three is love. The greatest of these is love. So what does this have to do with the day of Pentecost? Right, is some of you wondering? I know, I know one person that's wondering that. My friend Cheryl. <laughs> She's wondering, well, what does that have to do with what you started out with, Rob? She's on our planning team, and I know what she thinks. Uh, if it weren't for God's Spirit we would not be able to love. Not by this definition, not this definition of love. If it weren't for His Spirit, we wouldn't be able to do it. But let me, I want want you to hear this, and this is an absolute truth. Because of His Spirit, we can love this definition of love. Because of His Spirit. So one of the reasons we do celebrate recovery One of the things that I love about Celebrate Recovery, Celebrate Recovery believes. Celebrate Recovery has faith. Celebrate Recovery trusts in God's love, in God's power. Celebrate Recovery starts, it's tonight, starts at 5 o'clock. We eat at 5, and then the program starts at 6. If you have a hurt habit or hang-up, Celebrate Recovery works because it uses the real biblical principles of God. It teaches people how to love. Am I, is, that, is that right, Tracy and Kurt? I mean, that's, that's what it is, really, isn't it? It teaches people how to love, how to love others, how to love themselves. You know, it teaches people how to, to deal with their, their boastfulness, their pride, you know, their anger, all the things that love is not. And it teaches them how to do all the, the things that love is. It, it's kind. It's patient. It's, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It forgives, you know. We believe that. It's the reason we do Celebrate Recovery. I would encourage you, if you haven't come to any of the Celebrate Recovery meetings yet, I would encourage you just to come. If you have a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up, which is all of us, you can benefit from Celebrate Recovery. Um, That's what it's about. That's what Pentecost is about. God came and he demonstrated his power. He demonstrated his love. He demonstrated everything that he is through this experience to speak to all people, to to love all people, to include all people, to open his arms around the world and say, you are all invited. That's what Pentecost was about. And that same spirit that was given there today dwells in us, in this room. And we have the power. Some of us lack faith. Some of us lack this belief and we lack trust. But God's spirit gives us the power to love.